Okay. Hopefully you're in the right session. So this is a day in the life of a cybersecurity expert. Um, apologies for the schedule snafu, but uh, they kindly moved us to Friday instead of Saturday. Uh, so my name is Felicia Stocchetti, and I am the Computer Emergency Response Team Manager for the Center for Internet Security, specifically the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, that's a mouthful, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, we're going to introduce ourselves and then get right into the presentation. So I'm Derek Gerhardt. I'm a SOC analyst with the MSI SAC, CIS, the Elections Infrastructure ISAC. Um, yeah, and I'm Chris Satanic, and I am an intelligence analyst with MSI SAC, yeah, I said as well. Um, so just want to give you a quick overview of who we are specifically. So as I said, we're the Center for Internet Security. We're a nonprofit that um, kind of encompasses a whole slew of different services. And underneath CIS, we have three divisions. Uh, one is the multi-state ISAC. We service uh, state and local governments. The other is the Elections Infrastructure ISAC who services um, uh, election officials and uh, associated vendors and supporting members. And then also CIS Secure Suite, which is our benchmarks and controls um, that team that Phil Langlois in the audience works with. Um, so Secure Suite has a dotted line to state, and local, territory, and tribal governments because they actually get a free membership uh, as a part of the membership of the MSI SAC. Right, so what the MSI SAC is, we are actually designated by DHS to be the key resource for cyber threat uh, prevention, protection, response, and recovery. So what that essentially means is that if a state, local, tribal, or territorial government experiences a cyber incident, we're the ones that uh, can provide services and remediation for them. And our membership also includes uh, some public universities, uh, anything that's taxed like government is eligible for membership. So that doesn't just stop at your uh, typical government entities when you think government, this expands well beyond that. And then we also have the Elections Infrastructure ISAC, so this is new, um, but it's similar to the MS ISAC, and our duties are uh, similar in that we are supporting the elections infrastructure um, and the elections community, so elections officials are eligible to join, as well as supporting um, uh, vendors and those who are tied directly to elections, so this is same thing as the MSI SAC, just geared towards elections, and protecting our uh, elections infrastructure. So moving on to some of the uh, public information that we provide. So the multi-state ISAC uh, conducts uh, vulnerability advisories that we publish out to our members and to the public. So basically what we look for when drafting or writing advisories is software that's commonly used by our SLTT members, um, as well as any high-risk vulnerabilities. So we're looking for code execution, either remote or arbitrary, uh, as well as uh, you know, default passwords that have been left in software. Um, this you know, doesn't include less critical items. Uh, we usually tend to stick to advisories for the most important bits of information that need to be published publicly into our membership. Yeah, an additional service that we provide to the public is our monthly newsletters. So what these are are kind of your broader cybersecurity issues and topics that we want to cover. So this includes how to set up a backup was our most recent um, monthly newsletter. It was more general information and uh, training that's available out there. And we provide this as a service to the public. So I didn't mention earlier, but the MSI SAC is funded by the Department of Homeland Security. So in that partnership, we also offer a lot of um, services that DHS provides to our members. So among those are national webinars, which there's about six per year. And those are basically um, just sort of another vector for state and local governments and uh, other entities to kind of come together and talk about cybersecurity, different topics. And uh, we also hold the National Security, uh, sorry, Nationwide Cybersecurity Review, or NCSR. Um, so that's a self-assessment that our state and local governments can take and then measure themselves against other state and local governments in their same subsector. Um, we also provide security, or help uh, with DHS, provide security clearances for CISOs. And we do national and uh, regional exercises, tabletop exercises, 
such as Cyberstorm and CyberGuard, um, and there's a bunch of other ones that I'm sure I'm missing. Uh, and then there's also a bunch of other resources that DHS offers, such as the Cyber Resiliency Review, um, the Fed VTE, which is a great program that they put out for kind of um, sort of like SANS, but it's all free and there's a lot of trainings um, that they can take just on their own time. And then National uh, NCATS, which is the National Cybersecurity Assessments and Technical Services. So that's their um, kind of dedicated for security assessments, technical services that they provide, vulnerability assessments. Um, and then Stop, Think, and Connect, which is there in the public sector providing cybersecurity awareness for the public and uh, staying safe. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to, as a SOC analyst, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the day in the life of a SOC analyst with CIS and kind of our key roles and responsibilities. So we are the Security Operations Center. Uh, our primary responsibilities here are network analysis and incident escalation, uh, vulnerability review and advisory services, as well as initial uh, incident response support and communication. And we also monitor for account compromises as well as website defacements. So getting into this a little bit more, our operations center is manned around the clock uh, with analysts working overlapping shifts so that we can respond to any security incidents uh, at any time that they occur, whether that be overnight, uh, after work hours, on the weekends, over holidays. Um, we also, our primary responsibility is performing incident investigations. So what goes into this is we take a look at event logs that are triggered on our outward sensors, which I'll go into a little bit later. But these are deployed across the country with our membership, and if deemed actionable based on various different data points, um, an analyst will escalate it to the appropriate contacts and make sure that they can take action on it by providing any sort of detail that we can come up with. So we also, so we also uh, review vulnerability information um, that might either be sent to the SOC or that we discover doing open source research. And I did kind of mention the sort of vulnerabilities that we look for when doing these uh, based on software, hardware that our members use, as well as anything of a critical nature. Um, and then working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're often the first point of contact that either a member or an individual looking for more information has, uh, looking for information for the MSI stack or CIS. Um, so it's an essential function to be able to listen to our members as they report incidents and then effectively provide the assistance that we can and also know which teams or departments in our organization we can uh, direct them to, to provide ad additional, more detailed guidance. So, another key role, we monitor for account compromises. So we consider this to be a combination of email accounts as well as passwords, whether they're hashed or in plain text that have been publicly posted and are publicly available that shouldn't be. So, we find these in our own open source research, or again, we get reports from trusted third parties that find them on <coughs> other various sites or resources that they look for. And when we find these account compromise posts, we take a look at them, we identify if there are any SLTT account credentials, uh, and then we perform notifications based on that information. Uh, the last key item that we, that we perform with the SOC is monitoring for SLTT website defacements. So for this, we look for web pages that have either been maliciously edited or otherwise rendered inaccessible to the, the general public. Um, so we investigate 
from various open source sources, again, as well as trusted third party reports. We really rely on uh, both of those uh, to be able to verify if a page is actually defaced and then send notifications to our members uh, providing as much detail as we found and letting them know that a page is either down or otherwise defaced. And the, the, <laughs> the image here that's kind of small is uh, something that would be a clear indication to us that a website is defaced when it looks absolutely nothing like you would expect a government web page to look and you know usually contains um, Twitter handles and, and things like, of that nature. So I mentioned earlier about our Albert sensors, so I wanted to go a little bit into what those are. So our Albert sensors are a unique <coughs> network monitoring solution that we have. They utilize open source software and then we refine that information to create SLTT focused uh, IDS signatures. So in doing this, we combine it with our in-depth analysis and we try to determine both the nature and the severity of the observed traffic that would have triggered um, this malicious activity. So to kind of give you a general idea of the flow of this type of analysis, so the signature fires on the device, an alert is generated and sent to the SOC where we conduct analysis on it and then we determine if escalation is needed and make sure that it gets sent to the appropriate contacts when we do. So after an analyst identifies the information as being legitimate, uh, we'll send out a notification which includes a bunch of information that is uh, helpful to our member to identifying the affected entity, the affected host, uh, what was observed and trying to lead them down the path of how they can fix it. So we'll be looking at the IP addresses of either involved host. Uh, we'll also be looking for, um, we'll be providing any sort of incident details or stream detail that we can get, providing mitigation solutions, as well as uh, some actual traffic logs of the event that was observed. And then we also like to include any other pertinent information that we find in our investigation, whether or not that's helpful links to a page, or perhaps the availability of a um, open source ransomware decryptor that can be tried. Uh, we try to be as helpful as we can in these initial notifications to our members. And so that's it for the SOC for right now. I'm going to hand it off to Alicia for our SOC team. So we do, uh, as a computer emergency response team, we have three main functions. So incident response and remediation planning, computer forensics, and malware analysis. And on this uh, below, there's the five steps of incident response. There's all different kinds of uh, variations of this, but this is the one I like to use. So just to touch on this really quick, a lot of times when people uh, go through their incident response process, they miss the very first step, which is the most important in my opinion, and that's preparation. So in order to be prepared, you have to first know what your, um, an inventory of what you have in your, your infrastructure, what kind of software applications you're running, what kind of hardware you have. Um, otherwise, how are you ever going to protect what you're actually trying to protect? And basically, um, the last step is also my second most important step, in my opinion, is lessons learned. So in order to recover from an incident, how do you actually um, get to that point where you're reporting how it happened, getting in a group, talking about it, and then therefore or going forward and improving upon your processes. Um, so a couple of things you can do with the... Um, so a couple of things you can do with that is security assessments for the preparation stage. Um, you can do benchmarking and baselining. So at uh, CIS we have hardened images that we have available. Um, you can do um, a whole bunch of other stuff, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. My mouse is not working. There we go. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do to improve your infrastructure. 
And uh, I think that the incident response life cycle really touches upon all those points. So how many people know what forensics is? Good. Great. OK, so I'm not going to get into the formal definition of what forensics is. Um, but basically, in a nutshell, it's a branch of forensics, or forensic science that deals with the investigation and analysis of digital devices. So the computer forensics process as a whole is a really in-depth process. Um, it kind of starts with first identifying what is infected, and then from there, preserving the evidence, collecting what you actually need to go back and um, analyze in the lab. And then from there, you're going to actually examine it, uh, analyze it, interpret it, write the uh, documentation up as far as what happened, and then present it to your executive. Um, this can be kind of a hard process to present to executives because it is technical. So oftentimes, uh, I find myself having to kind of baseline it as far as coming up with um, comparisons that can kind of help executives understand what is at risk and then how to uh, move forward and protect it. Um, so, Forensics 101, for anyone who doesn't know, a forensic image is a bit-for-bit -bit copy of the USB, CD, hard drive, or whatever you're trying to um, image. And then, as far as verifying what a forensic image is, we use a method called hashing, which is basically a one-way cryptographic method that's used to basically verify the integrity of the media. So, um, unfortunately, with one small change of file, it can change the hash value, and if you're, say, presenting it in a court of law, it can totally make your um, case potentially more hard to um, prove to the jury that something is intact from its original uh, form. And then up there also you see a couple of pictures. So the bottom is a chain of custody form. So that's used a lot in the legal world and in forensics. So basically take a um, chain, for lack of better terms, of where the evidence started and then continue it all the way up until it gets destroyed. And the top part, uh, or top picture, is a break blocker, which is we use in the CERT lab to connect the evidence so that it doesn't actually get overwritten or changed in any way, shape, or form. So being in the CERT is challenging at times, and we face a lot of problems. Um, a couple of problems to just touch upon. As we move into more cloud storage, it becomes more difficult sometimes to get these logs. Um, sometimes you have to go back to the manufacturer or the vendor to get these logs. You have to get subpoenas. And um, we haven't dealt with it a ton on our end yet, but I assume that as we become more cloud-based that we face more of those issues. And then also um, logging. So this is something that I know a lot of people struggle with, and you can log your server to death, which <laughs> is never a good thing. Um, but you really need to know what you're logging, and not only what you're logging, but who's going to look at those logs. So you can log all day long, but if no one's looking at them, then it's really not going to make much of an impact. Um, Anti-forensics, so time stamping, which if no one knows what that is, basically it's where an attacker can actually alter a timestamp and make it look like it was ran a week ago as opposed to, um, or created a week ago as opposed to today. Uh, and the log clearing, which is uh, unfortunate because a lot of attackers do this, where they'll actually go through and clear a security log or an application log. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't help us figure out what happened, but it does give us the tip that they cleared it, because <laughs> they'll have an event in there that will actually say, this log was cleared on this day. Uh, and, you know, unless an administrator accidentally deleted it or maybe intentionally deleted it, it's probably the attacker going in there and doing it. Um, and then remediation and re-imaging before actually capturing it, an image. A lot of times we face this where somebody will clear an entire system and then say, can you please tell me what's wrong with this or what happened? And I always kind of chuckle because I'm like, you know, how can I tell if you've already erased everything? Um, but it's, it's unfortunate and it really comes back to the um, preparation phase. So having an incident response plan and knowing it and practicing it is a big thing. Um, because if you're not practicing it, then when things happen and everything goes crazy, you're not going to know what to do. 
Um, you're going to be running around and saying my computer's on fire. That's the rest of this picture. Uh, memory considerations. This is also a big one since a lot of memory or malware runs in uh, memory these days. Um, if you pull the network cable, that's fine. That's recommended because you don't want a malware uh, infection to spread from system to system. But if you pull the power cable and it runs only in memory, guess what? Your evidence is probably not there. Once you have a laptop in hibernation mode, and then maybe you have some stuff that's left over. Um, and then obviously evidence temporary, legal considerations, this isn't just specific to forensics, this can be in any field, um, but it's always a problem that you know can come about. Weak controls and infrastructure and small cybersecurity budgets, I don't think that this is something that no one is aware of. Um, as we work for the MSI SAC, unfortunately we see where some you know, some government, governments may be struggling where others are thriving, and it's because sometimes they don't have, you know, a lot of money to allocate to their cybersecurity needs. So, as I was in the uh, risk assessment talk this morning, they mentioned talk, picking your top five risks and which ones you, do you need to work on and which ones you have to say, you know, these are important, but I can't get to those right now. So, it's unfortunate, but you kind of have to pick and choose. You can't have everything. Um, and obviously, as we move into the IoT world, there's a lot of data out there, and it's not just on computers and cell phones and tablets. It's on your smart water meter or your Alexa. Um, I had a formal education at the University of Albany, and one of those courses I took was uh, our moot court class, which you know Nick was in with me. Um, <laughs> and we talked about a case where um, Somebody had an Alexa that they were using in a criminal investigation. And it just kind of is scary because, you know, hopefully there's no criminals in the room. Um, <laughs> but the data that we have on those devices can be used against us. And it's, um, it's frightening to think about. So I guess we can't be too paranoid. Otherwise, we'll just be living in a horrible world. But we have to just be aware of it and what kind of data they're collecting and what they're doing with the data, how they're storing it. Um, I know myself, I always ask, like, what are you doing with my social security number? Or what are you doing with, you know, X, Y, and Z data? And some people are like, well, I don't know. And that kind of scares me. I'm like, well, if I'm giving you my data, then, you know, you should know what you're doing with it. Um, but it's unfortunate that that happens. So um, a couple of things that I just want to talk about. Um, if anyone's never used this poster, I recommend it. Even if you're not in the forensics uh, environment, it's a really great poster um, that I use and my team uses in their day-to-day -day work. So basically, it's just a chart of artifacts on the Windows um, operating system that you can look at different artifacts. So say you wanted to find uh, evidence of process execution. So I would be looking at prefetch files or shim cache, uh, user assist down to the user's registry. So um, it's really great. There's, I put some artifacts on the side that uh, we specifically look at. The registry is one of my favorite because um, basically you can find a lot in a registry. I've done multiple cases where I've pretty much solved everything just by looking at the registry files. It's kind of one of those hidden gems that when you find something and you've got enough data to prove what happened, it's, uh, it's a good win. Uh, and then just as far as some tools that we use, uh, we're tool agnostic, but I do recommend some free tools that I have up on there um, that I personally use. So FTK Imager, uh, we use FTK. That's about one of the only paid tools that we use at, um, in our CERT team. Or, sorry, CERT. <laughs> um, but we also use the SAN SIF workstation, which uh, built on Ubuntu, and that's really great. It has a lot of great tools in there. Volatility, which is used for memory analysis. Um, I'm actually working on my GCFA right now, and I'm using that. It's a really great tool to use. Red Ripper, uh, that's for registry files. So it'll go through, it'll parse all the registry, it'll pull out reports, um, give you nice text files, you can grep them. It's a wonderful tool. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch more, but I know that Chris has to get to the parts, so I'm going to take up all the time. Perfect, thank you. So, I'm Chris Attack. I'm with the Cyber Intelligence Team at the NSI SAC. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do, uh, separate from the CERT and uh, SOC teams. So what we really focus on is more of the strategic 
uh, what's going on in the soccer threat landscape. So where CERT and soccer are doing some really great tactical analysis of uh, specific events and breadth of cases, we're looking at, okay, what are the trends? What are the big picture uh, things that are going on? And then we're sharing this with our partners in a timely and actionable way. So we want to make sure that the information we're sharing is useful and that they can use this to help defend their networks. So a lot of what we do is focused on forecasting too. It's more important to say, okay, this is happening, but also what's likely to change? What's going to happen in the next week to month, et cetera? And how we communicate this information is by using a uh, bottom line up front format, otherwise known as bluff. So this is just simply saying the most important information goes up front, and then everything else in the substantiation goes below it. So it's just a way in which we communicate in intelligence. Who do we work with? We're working with our state, local, tribal, and territorial government partners. We're also working with various levels of law enforcement, as well as our federal partners. So as I mentioned, we're providing cyber threat intelligence through 24 by 7 assistance, and we're providing this information, including tactics, techniques, and procedures. So we're concerned what are the TTPs, the threat actors that are targeting state, local, and tribal governments, what are they using? What's, uh, how are they getting into these systems? How are they then acting once they get on those systems? So that's something we focus on. We want to pay attention to the TTPs. We want to share out indicators of compromise. So if we see um, specific indicators come from our CERT team, or sorry, CERT, <laughs> we will then take a look at those indicators and we want to share those so that we can help create signatures and defend against those. Uh, we also collect cyber threat actor information. So these, we want to know who is targeting governments. Why are they, uh, why are they targeting them? So we want to know the motivation. We want to know who's out there and who's doing this. And we commonly go to sources like Twitter to do this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we get a lot of hacktivists or people who are very uh, upset about a particular political situation or ideological belief, and they feel that they need to uh, attack governments to achieve their goals and spread the word, and then they brag about it on Twitter. So that's one source that we use to pull from. We also provide answers to technical questions. So our partners will reach out to us and they'll say, hey, you know, I've got this email in my inbox. Is anybody else seeing this? Is this something that's uh, just targeted to us, or is this a bigger, bigger picture? So we can provide that assistance on an ad hoc basis. We also do a lot of statistics. So since we have a lot of a very unique data set, being the MSI set and collecting uh, data on attacks against state, local, tribal, territorial governments, we have one of the most unique data sets in the country. So we get to use this data then to forecast, see what trends are out there, see what these attackers are doing, and then we'll write papers on that uh, information to relay that to our partners. And one product that I want to emphasize are our cyber alerts. So this is the type of product that's going to go out during those high profile events. So, for example, WannaCry and NotPetya. They're big, big deal malware. They're compromising a lot of systems. We need to get information out to our partners right away. How do you defend against this? What's going on? Where are they targeting? Am I going to be hit? And we want to get that information in uh, aggregated at the MSISF and provide accurate information to our partners as soon as we can. So that's what our cyber alerts will achieve. And we try to push these out really only when there's these crucial events going on. I'm going to talk a little bit about what intelligence is as well. And then we're going to walk through a case study of how we might look at a particular problem or malware and how we work through the intelligence cycle to achieve that. So first I want to open the floor. Does anybody know what uh, intelligence is? Or has anyone heard uh, intelligence is tossed around quite a bit, but what is intelligence? It's often this ambiguous term and I've heard it referred to as a process, a product, or an organization. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to call it the analysis of raw data and information into a specific process product. So this is also where we're providing assessments. So we're taking a look at all this raw information. We're then looking at it, filtering it down to what it means. And that's really what intelligence is. It's making sense of a lot of information. So you can see here in the cycle, we've got a requirement stage collection, analysis, dissemination, and feedback. And I want to emphasize that these are not occurring in silos. When you're working on collection, you're not just doing collection, you're also doing some analysis. You're taking a look at what's coming in, and you're providing some analysis on it. And that's what this chart here is showing, that you're also working analysis, production, and feedback all at the same time, just to varying levels of effort. So diving in, what are the key intelligence questions for the MSI set? 
but we're concerned with what are the biggest threats out there to our constituents and our, our sorry, not our constituents, our members. What are we trying to prevent? And so, what are the most prevalent threats? And for example, in this case, I'm going to take a look at the highly disruptive and very costly malware known as Emotet. This malware has been in our top ten, uh, meaning it's been very prevalent and has been hitting SLTT governments since April, causing over a million dollars of damage to single entities, $300,000 plus in damages and remediation costs. And we can confirm by looking at our CERT data as well as our SOC data that this is something that's continually affecting our membership. We want to keep an eye on it and get ahead of it. So we're going to start the collection stage. We know something's going on. We know we have something that we need to answer. So we're going to take a look at Emotet and we're going to look at our data and we're going to see through our CERT cases and our forensic cases that it's being spread through mail spam. So it's being sent to people's inboxes via these emails that are reaching out and downloading this malicious file. And then, once it's on the system, it's propagating the entire network and causing tons of damage and costing our governments millions of dollars to remediate. So we want to solve this. We want to get this information out to our partners. How do they fix this? How do they prevent this? So we're going to do some more open source research. We're looking at Twitter. We're looking at, um, and that might surprise you, but a lot of good information is shared on Twitter. We just have to verify it compared to our own internal data, compared to mail or tech blogs, and other places where this information is being shared. We also have suspicious email reporting. So our members are reporting our emails into our inboxes, and we're taking a look at those and saying, wow, this is something that's really hitting a lot of our members. How do we prevent this? Now, for me, this is where things get exciting. We get the mail spam in our inbox, and now we get a chance to actually look at how is this being distributed. So these are two examples of a malicious email. For me, time. I'll give you a second to look at that while I take a sip of water here. So, as you're looking at this, you might see a few things. What I see is that they've put a logo on there. They've branded it with UPS. They've put our name in it, and the bottom you can see it says from MSI SAC. So this is a sophisticated app. They know who their target is, and they also know what's going to be relevant to them. So they're sending these crafted emails to the targets. This is time we've got some sophisticated. So we're in the analysis stage. We're trying to break down the problem into five W's. Who is doing this? What are they doing? What's their intent? How are they doing it? Etc. This is where we're drawing relationships between infrastructure and their tactics, techniques, and procedures. But why are we doing this? The goal here is so that we can provide this information to our membership so they can better allocate their defenses so that they can take a look and say, how are we going to defend against our network? If we know they're targeting email, we can warn our membership and say, hey, warn your employees if you're seeing invoices or if you're seeing fraudulent um, shipping notices, keep an eye on that, warn your employees, and let them know that this is happening and that if you click on that, that will spread <laughs> throughout your entire network. So once we've done our analysis, we've drawn our conclusions, we know um, how it's spreading, we know how it's getting out there, and we know how it's starting to move throughout these networks. We need to get the word out. So how we do that is, and how we communicate that, is through words of estimated probability. If I say it's almost certainly going to rain tomorrow, that means something different than if I say it's unlikely, or it's likely going to rain. So we need to use those words of estimated probability to communicate that, and then we also want to communicate our analytic confidence. So if we're using Twitter as our sole source, our analytic confidence on this information is going to be low. And we want to relay that, and we don't want to say that we're highly confident in this information if it's coming from Twitter. We rarely do that, though. We usually want to correlate and don't put out low analytic products. We want to do a high confidence product, because that's what our membership demands. So using the gathered information and intelligence that we've put together, we're going to put together a product, in this case a security primer, and then we're going to also put together an infographic to take this complex issue and really break it down to its simple parts and how it moves throughout the network and how you can defend against it. And we want to disseminate this to our members and the larger InfoSec community as a whole. So this is the final result of our Evertech uh, primer that we put out. We put out a write-up on what it's doing, and then we also put out this infographic. So you, see, you can see in the first stage, we've got our infection. In stage two, how it establishes persistence how it's hooking into your system and really maintaining that persistence. Stage three, how it's reaching out to its infrastructure. 
telling you every, telling the attacker everything about your system, downloading instructions, and dropping more malware onto your systems. And then in stage four, this is where the damage is done. It's really spreading throughout your entire network, causing a nightmare for remediation, and costing you millions of dollars. So this is our product. We send this out to our membership. They get it. They, we also include the information on how to potentially prevent this from happening to you. It's awareness. It's also indicators when you can share them. Unfortunately, even with that's a little bit different because it evolves, and those indicators change constantly. So we have to stay ahead of it through intelligence gathering and really emphasizing this is how it's done, this is how it's spread. And then once that product goes out the door, we start to get feedback. We start getting members calling us on the phone and saying, hey, I think I have this on my system. And we start to get new indicators. And those indicators then become uh, signatures. So we're able to take that information that comes in from members and we see, wow, this is how it communicates with C2. Can we capture that through our Albert sensors? So we'll redraft that. We'll put that as a signature and we'll push that out to our members. And now we can see new traffic that's being generated by this malware. We get new CERT cases. So as members say, wow, this is something that's hitting our network, they'll send it in for computer forensics. We'll do a full forensic report. We'll figure out how it got on the system, if it's changing, if it's evolving. All this information is added to the pile, and this process starts all over again. We start doing analysis again, we start doing collection, and we work through the problem once again. So that concludes what I have in terms of intelligence and what uh, we do in terms of the day-to-day. -day. Uh, that's just a small component. I want to do a case study of malware, but we also do a lot of threat actor tracking and uh, a variety of different uh, trends and analysis with what the future holds. So with that, I'm going to move on to Alicia here and talk about what it takes to become a cybersecurity expert. So do we have any cybersecurity experts in the room? No, we were actually talking about this during lunch. Um, I think cybersecurity expert is a really uh, heavy feat to accomplish. I think that a lot of times people um, throw the word around, but really, I mean, everyone's maybe an expert in their specific field. So, Ron, you might be an expert in engineering, um, but are you an expert in intelligence? Um, but they both encompass cybersecurity. So, just to touch on, in closing, um, all of us at the MSI SAC and CIS go through a lot of training, and it never stops. Uh, I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with me that you can't just go to school, get your job, and say, okay, I'm a cybersecurity expert, and I'm done. Um, it constantly means staying ahead of the curve, being ahead of the attackers. Certification, higher education, research, reading, a lot of it. We're constantly reading every single day um, and researching new vulnerabilities, new, new malware, new trends, and so on and so forth. And patience. So a lot of times you try and maybe you try again if it doesn't work. It's testing, it's quality assurance, it's making sure that you know, people are doing their due diligence. Maybe they don't get it right the first time, but you know, just try until you finally get it right. And collaboration. I don't think any of us could do what we do without the help of our partners, our members, um, you know, everyone. DHS, it's really, a, it's a collaborative effort. And um, it's really kind of neat to be a part of the bigger picture. And uh, the last two are my favorite. So curiosity. Um, when I first started in this field, my boss used to tell me, you make a really good analyst because you're curious. And you have good intuition. Um, I think that it's having the right balance of paranoia and intuition is really the good or the best definition I can think of. So when I, I know when I'm doing a forensics case specifically, I always look at something and um, you know I'm like, hmm, is that bad or is that good? And usually um, it's bad, but <laughs> um, but you know it's having that that level of curiosity and paranoia so that you're not going down maybe a rabbit hole for six days analyzing something but you just have enough intuition to know if something is worth even going down that, that rabbit hole. Um, so it's definitely, it's difficult. We fight every day, fight for the, the better of a better good of our country. Um, but I think in the end, we're really doing great things at CIS and just in general in the cybersecurity industry as a whole. I think I read a statistic, which Ryan Spellman is talking on later, that there's, I think, 3.5 million cybersecurity job def deficit by 2021. 
Um, that's a huge number, and we can't do that. Uh, we can't do our job well if we're not actively trying to get, you know, people coming out of the gate with from higher education and those, um, you know, just other areas and trying to broaden their horizons and increase their knowledge base. Um, we're never going to get ahead of the attackers if we don't uh, work together. So, with that, does anyone have any questions? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, you mentioned the uh, basically the you know that we don't have enough cybersecurity experts or people coming out of school that want to operate in the space, and and I think that, that I've heard that from a lot of places. It sounds like it's a real thing. So, are you suggesting that we just need like to like invest more money in this space, or that there's a better more intelligent way of addressing the problem, or what's the solution to that problem? Um, well, I think that... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Like, so, yeah. oh, yeah, sure. So, I'd like to take a shot at this. I think a big thing about, um, really, you can throw a lot of money at it, which has already been done. There's actually a lot of initiatives on improving the cybersecurity workforce. But I think a lot of what we need to do is really emphasize how exciting and how interesting this career field can be. It can really be, uh, it's a collaborative environment. You don't sit at your desk all day and just work one thing. You're working with uh, your teams. You're, you need to do that information sharing. You need to talk to your uh, experts in different fields. And there's no one expert. So it's a really, it gives you a chance to get out there and communicate, talk with your partners and, and colleagues and really move forward. It's an exciting field and we need to share that information. We need to generate that interest, not just say, hey, this is something that's going to make you a lot of money. Uh, I think that's, most people look at that and they say, oh, okay. But if you make it interesting, if you make it exciting, and you really generate that curiosity, uh, that's what's really going to help improve the workforce. I also just want to comment, so this actually is not my first um, career choice in cybersecurity or forensics, so it's actually my third. <laughs> um, but I think coming from that, you know, other areas of my life and then into cybersecurity and forensics, I can really say that, um, like Chris said, you have to make it interesting. So that's really what got me interested in this field in the first place is having a job where I didn't know anything about cybersecurity at one point and then it sort of just, you know, snowballed from there and I got interested in it. And I think a lot of it too starts in, um, like in our curriculum in our schools, not just college and high school doing things with students as young as, you know, third grade, second grade, and getting them interested um, so they don't become the hacker, they actually become <laughs> the people on our side and engaged um, in that arena in an early stage. Yes. Either one. <laughs> uh, how were you able to pivot from going, from not knowing much about cybersecurity to becoming part of the CERT team? Um, <laughs> it was definitely difficult. So my previous job um, was actually handed a stack of credit card chargebacks and was told to file them. Um, and I didn't know what a credit card chargeback was. I was like, okay. So my first question, being intuitive and curious, was, well, are we doing anything to help solve this problem? Or are we, you know, just going to throw thousands of dollars away and say, okay? Um, so I think that's sort of what sparked my interest, and then I ended up uh, taking some night classes, getting my prerequisites, and then going to the Albany uh, College for Digital Forensics. Um, but that's really how it's, it started for me. Uh, and I have my own challenges. You know, every day there's something new that I might not know about. I read a lot. I think my husband can attest to this, that I constantly have my head in a book. Um, like I said, I'm studying for my GCFA right now, and I read every single night for hours on end. Um, but I put the time into it, you know, and I think that all, all of our lives are super busy, but if you just take the time, you can really do anything you want. And it's just a matter of dedicating that, you know, time. I mean, just to add a little comment on it from my own experience. Um, no, I didn't have a high school that had any computer classes. My parents were paranoid at home that I was going to wreck the computer. So I wasn't even allowed to touch it for probably more than 45 minutes at a time. Um, so 
where the interest really came for me is the fact that I had this lack of knowledge um, and I saw as a, as a high school senior looking for college degrees, I saw this trend that you know computers and technology were going to become an even bigger part of our everyday life. And it made sense to me that keeping them secure, or on the other side, having people who want to exploit these things that are all part of our day, was just naturally going to occur. So when I found you know an information security related field, you know I jumped on the opportunity, and I went in knowing absolutely nothing about computers, networking, programming. Um, you know, it, it took a lot of work not having that information to be able to learn it all and then opportunities with um, you know, the right jobs and the right training and certificates. You know, I have uh, a GCIA and a GNFA and I'm currently working on my GCTI. These are all things that in college I didn't know existed. And after coming into the field and learning that there's different kinds of specialties or additional trainings that you can go into, it really lets you expand your own personal interests. And I think that's when we combine that with working with other teams, with other individuals, um, you know, you really get that community aspect. And it helps you learn. You can learn from each other and learn from all these opportunities.